This is WBZ TV Channel 4 Boston and it's time now for Arch McDonald in the news. The 6.15 p.m. report for this. September 4th, 1951 and a Tuesday. Here now, Arch McDonald. Good evening, everybody, and here now in the news. Assistant Attorney General David H. Stewart's offer of immunity to anyone given information on the murder of State Trooper L. G. M. Savalia was promptly countermanded by Attorney General Francis E. Kelly last night. Kelly has instructed that Stewart not to grant such immunity except when the specific consent of local, state, and county law enforcement officials. Stewart, who heads a four-member team named by Kelly the district to direct the Worcester County District Attorney's Office, announced yesterday that he was going to take over supervision of the Savannah murder probe. Kelly, in his statement, said that his office is not superseding any law enforcement officials in this case. Its purpose is only to provide assistance and cooperation, he said. I have instructed Stuart not to use the legal power of the Attorney General to grant immunity to any person who may have been present at the time of the killing, but who will in no way participate in an unless local, state, or county law enforcement officials consent. Kelly said, a veteran of Pearl Harbor and South Pacific fighting was killed when a 7-inch bone and knife followed in an argument in the South End Department last night. Daniel Heltman, 20 single of 140 Fells Way West in Medford, was pronounced dead by Dr. Joseph Pandavino, police physician. Two men, one resident of Tremont Street Department, where the stabbing occurred, and the other companion of Heverman, were being held by police as suspicious persons. According to Detective Lieutenant Raymond A. L. Monahan, the stabbing is an apparent homicide. Police said that Heverman and his companion went to visit the Tremont Street man early this afternoon to borrow money. During the visit, an argument ensued over two dollars. Police said. Summers last weekend drizzled to a close last night. A complete fizzle. The rainy hours of the holiday found few motors on the highways. Beach resorts usually packed with gay Labor Day crowds. Echoed amply. Cash registers were silent. Three days of rain and cold had discouraged most vacationers early. They were back by their festivity firesides last night after prematurely putting inside their summer fun. There were two bright spots in an otherwise glum picture. Few accidents were reported over New England highways, which have claimed a total of 18 lives Saturday and Sunday. The weather bureau predicted storm clouds would clear up today and it would be warm up somewhat. Reports from the state police checkpoints from all over New England last night provided similar descriptions of traffic light to moderate. Now new highway deaths were reported. Mrs. Maddie M. Gould, a 58-year-old woman from Chris Lake Street in Haverhill, a nurse at Glenn Memorial Hospital in Haverhill, injured in an auto crash Saturday, died yesterday at Hale Hospital in Haverhill. Her death brought total highway fatalities in the state to 8 since 3 p.m. on Friday. Maine and Connecticut each reported four highway deaths for a similar period. Two fatalities occurred in Vermont and one in Rhode Island and one in New Hampshire and Rhode Island's record was clear. Miami, Florida, the hurricane in the Caribbean Sea shifted its course last night and pounded directly toward the already storm-battered British island of Jamaica. Unless the tropical twister again changed its direction during the night, the Miami Weather Bureau said it likely will slam into Jamaica into mid-morning. Today, Covering the same ground where 150 people perished in a hurricane last month. The most immediate threat was to the southern coast of the Dominican Republic and Haiti, where hurricane warnings were hoisted there till 5 p.m. Winds in the northern semicircle of the hurricane were expected to strike a landing blow to the east coast. Venice, Italy, the mysterious Mexican born millionaire of Vernus Fru, a $50,000 past woman, masquerade party last night for the title and wealthy of three continents. The 18th century style extravaganza was guarded by the greatest police turnout seen here since wartime. Some of the top notables invited stayed away from the regrets of disdain. The dapper, monocled host Don Coste Bestegi turned out in a jewel deck black 18th century governor's costume to greet the gondola born guest at his doorstep on the Grand Canal. He wore shoes with soles six inches thick to his lean form, close to six feet tall, would tower over them all. American workers pulled communist profits because they refused the war on private enterprise and instead went to defend and strengthen it. Secretary of Labor Morse J. Tobin declared here yesterday. The American trade union movement has never had moved its idea of class conflict in its safe bet is never. Well, as a whole, it is most militant for communism as anywhere in the world. He addressed at a Labor Day radio address. The Labor Secretary said there were 49,000 Americans who work for the wages and salaries, but they have never become a work class. They don't act alike or think alike or vote alike. Their individualism may not be quite so rugged as that of other their foreign ancestors, but there's plenty of it. In San Francisco, President Truman in a nationally broadcast speech on the eve of the Japanese peace treaty 
Comet said tonight that the United States is ready at any time to reach at an audible settlement in Korea. Nevertheless, the president warned that this government does not know whether the communists intend to resume the Kaesong truce talks in the plain. Fact is that the communists may try to resume the offensive in Korea at any time. Wherever, said Mr. Truman, who spoke at 10.55 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time on a program opened in 1951, defense bond drive, they are capable of launching new attacks in Europe, in the Middle East, or elsewhere in Asia, wherever it suits them. The president's speech climaxed an hour-long radio show over five networks launching the government's largest bond drive since World War II. Secretary of the Treasury, John, John W. Snyder, introduced Mr. Truman in a truck from Grand Rapids, Michigan, where the bond program originated. In Tokyo, General Matthew B. Widgway conferred today with his chief negotiator for the suspended case on truce talks. The Supreme Allied Commander held a close two-hour conference beginning at 8.30 a.m. with Vice Admiral C. Turner Joy. There were no immediate word on that transpired. The atmosphere over the red suspended truce talks was tense. Lieutenant General Nem, the second chief red negotiator, totally rejected Joy's latest denial of red charges of allied neutrality violations of Kaesong. Song. The Reds broke off talks on August 23rd. Nem, in a statement dated September 3rd, ridiculed Joy's denial that a allied plane dropped a flare in the neutral zone August 29th. Joy arrived in Tokyo last night with two of his negotiators, Rear Admiral Ali Burke and Major General L.C. Craigle. Tension in Korea and Tokyo are the greatest since the Kaesong talks began July 10th. The two Massachusetts at National Air Guardsmen sped a spectacular and successful Mercy flight brought P Soup weather to Toronto, Canada yesterday, carrying in a new Boston developed medicine to a young mother bleeding to death. The two engine craft given special clues by Washington after hurried early morning calls called six small vials of fibrogen carried a blood calculator developed just a few months ago at Atlanta and Hospital and available in only a few cities. As soon as a big C-47 set down at the Toronto airport, the life-saving white powder was transferred to the women's waiting doctor escorted by a police cruiser. He rushed it to the Toronto General Hospital. The woman, Mrs. Nadine Cranfield, 25, was reported last night to be recovering after the fibrogen was administered. Her baby was dead at birth, and when complications set in, the doctor were unable to stop bleeding despite transfusions of 14 pints. San Francisco, 11 nations most directly concerned with the Japanese peace treaty agreed last night on the rails of procedure designed to threat expected Russian maneuvers to upset the peace conference open here last night and tonight. The agreement came at a two hour meeting of 21 delegations shortly after President Truman arrived by air from Washington and went into a long private comments with Secretary of State Dean Acheson. Agreement on the rigid rules of procedure came from the representatives of the Australia, Canada, Ceylon, France, Indonesia, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Pakistan, the Philippines, Great Britain, and the United States. Those nations together with Russia, India, Burma, and China form the Far Eastern Commission, the Allied body set up to direct Japan's affairs under the Allied occupation. And right, a Gromoko Hint that the Soviet delegation was not invited in the meeting. India and Burma had rejected invitations to the peace conference and China was not invited. After the meeting, Kenneth Younger, British Minister of State, who served as a chairman in Israel as a co-sponsor of the treaty, said the rules would be circulated to all the other 41 delegations to the peace conference tomorrow and today. The preliminary agreement on the rules raised hopes that they would adopt it perhaps more quickly than most officials had expected. Russia, supported by Poland and Czechoslovakia, expected to try to throw an elaborate roadblock in the way of the adoption of the rules, but this move now seems doomed. Control your lights. The first coast-to-coast -coast television hookup tonight by the opening of the Japanese Peace Treaty Conference in San Francisco lick up the areas with 85 million in the nation's population watching. How many of will see the historic telecast of President Truman's address at 9.30 p.m. tonight? Eastern Standard Time is anybody's guess. The hookup over the American Telephone Telegraph Company's new 40 million arm microwave radio relay system not only will enable TV to span the continent for the first time, but also had four cities to the 15 now with a video network connections. The International Broadcasting Company's research director, Hugh M. Belleville, at a space of four cities. Salt Lake City, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Diego have 1.38 million television sets. In San Francisco, Mrs. Dean Agenson attracted by the Secretary of State and last night told President Truman and had told her husband several times that he wanted the diplomat to stay out of office. She described the criticism well of her husband as very repetitious. Mrs. Aitchison, a talented painter who majored in art at Wellesley College, who, whose work has been exhibited in several one women shows in Washington and New York, said she felt it's the duty of a diplomatic wife to run at home. 
A home should be a place free from worry. She said, I avoided discussing world affairs with my husband. Okay, now the weather, Peter Wiggins. Thank you, Mr. Arch McDonald. Right now, our current conditions at 6.25 p.m. in Logan Airport in Boston, Massachusetts. 75 degrees the temperature with a dew point about 47 degrees. Humidity 37% by a rubber 3.02 inches. Visibly 15 miles winds northwest around 11. And clear skies is the omen of the forecast by 6 o'clock hour. Grand Region at 72 out in Bedford and in Lawrence and in Beverly. 68 out in Fitchburg and Worcester. 73 out in Springfield. 71 out in Albany. 70 down in New York City. Pair 73 is in Hartford and New Haven, Connecticut. 71 out in Providence. 75 in Norwood. 69 in Taunton and Plymouth and Marshfield. And New Bedford and Hyannis and Moss Vineyard. 67 in Nantucket. 72 out in Nashville, New Hampshire. 74 in Manchester and Portsmouth, New Hampshire. 73 out in Concord, New Hampshire, 71 in Portland, Maine, pair of 70s in Augusta and Bangor, Maine, 47 in Mount Washington, 70 out in Burlington, Vermont, and 66 out in Montpelier, Vermont. What about the United Nations today? The greater portion of the United States today enjoyed joint fair weather with exception of narrow bend light, rain and drizzle extended from the northern plains southeastward to the central Mississippi Valley. Temperatures over the eastern half of the nation remain pleasantly. Cool. Wall and Gulf states and uh, southwestern states quite hot weather continued. So our forecast of all our specific to go like this. Sunny and warmer Tuesday with high temperature in middle 70s. Wednesday, fair and little change in temperature. General northwesterly winds today. By New England except Maine, Sunday and warmer Tuesday and Wednesday, fair and little change in temperature. Maine, because they're both cutting this Tuesday morning, including warmer, fair and little cooler at night. Wednesday, fair and little change in temperature. For east part to Block Island, general moderate north to northwest winds, fair except to the cloudy skies along Maine coast during the morning. Physically good in Block Island and Cape Hatteras, general winds are mostly northerly over the central and north portions on Tuesday, and moderate shifting winds becoming mostly northeast over the extreme south portion. Rather cloudy with scattered thunder squalls, likely in south portion, visibly rather poor over the central and north portions in the morning. Sunset, 7.15 p.m. Moonset, 8.25 p.m. Turn on LS by 7.45 p.m. First quarter moon, September 8 to 16 p.m. Full moon, September 15th, 8.38 a.m. Last quarter moon, September 23rd, 12.13 a.m. And September 30th, 8.57 p.m. to be in the new moon. And that's coming for the Arch McDonald News and Peter Wiggins wherever on WBZ TV Channel 4 in Boston. I'm Arch McDonald alongside Peter. Hope you have a good evening. I'll see you later on. Bye-bye, buddy.